Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon text is the Gospel reading from Luke chapter 16. Please feel free to grab a Bible from the pew rack in front of you or turn to the reading in your bulletin. My dear friends in Christ, I've got up here a dollar bill. I'm not going to do a magic trick, I promise. Uh, this is probably the most commonly used bill out of all the money that's printed and exchanged in this country each year. It's the lowest denomination of bill that we have, uh, but, but we use bills like this almost every single day. On the, on the front of it, you've got that familiar picture of, of George Washington, our nation's first president. Above him, it says the United States of America, and, and above that, it says it's a Federal Reserve note, and off to the side, it says this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. You've got serial numbers here on the upper right and upper left hand portion of the bill. And then when you flip it over to the back, it tells you again right in the middle there that it's worth one dollar. There's the, the great pyramid over here on the left side of it and with the, the Latin words around it that nobody can pronounce and, and most people have no idea what they say anyway. And then on the right side you've got the great seal of the United States with the eagle and he's holding the, the olive branches and the, the arrows. And right there, right there in the middle, just above that large word one, you've got the words, in God we trust. Now, these words have led to a lot of arguments, especially over the past several years. Some people say that since our country was founded on Christian principles, they should remain there. Others say that it violates the separation of church and state in our country. Personally, I don't really care all that much if it's taken off the bill. I don't really care all that much if they leave it on the bill. To me, the dollar is much more important in a different way. I'm not nearly as concerned with what it says on it. I'm much more concerned that I can use it to pay my bills and, and the things that I need to buy each week. But this bill, bills like this, are very important to us for a lot of reasons. Many businesses will, will take the first dollar that they, that they earned when they open their store and they'll, they'll frame it and they'll hang it up on the wall. They want a, a reminder that they started their business with just one purchase, with just one dollar. You used to be able to take one of these to the gas station and buy a bottle of soda and you even get some change back. Now, of course, you've got to take this and a little bit of change with you in order to buy that same bottle of soda. If I were to take this dollar with me and, and drive down into the city, there's, there's many different intersections where I could stop and, and roll down my window and I could, I could give it to someone who's sitting there on the side of the road asking for money. This little white and green piece of paper has a lot of power and it can do a lot of different things. Money has a strange effect on people. People tend to get a little bit silly or sometimes downright crazy when it comes to money. People will go to great lengths to get more of it. People will do all sorts of different things in order to keep as much of it as they can. Money influences us greatly. I mean, we've heard many different stories about people skimming a little bit off the top at their jobs. They might only take a few dollars at a time, but it adds up and eventually they wind up with several thousands of dollars and they often end up getting caught and getting into trouble for stealing. And once in a while, you'll hear a story about someone finding a wallet or a bag full of money out on the street and returning it to its rightful owner. Although I'm sure the vast majority of the time, if someone finds money just lying around, they probably go ahead, put it in their pocket, and move on with their day. In many, in many businesses in our country, you're encouraged to work hard for the company to make them as much money as you can. And, and sometimes there's incentives for doing that. They might give you a little bit extra money if you make them a certain amount during a certain period of time. Money, as they say, makes the world go round. <clears throat> well, things were very similar during the time of Jesus. People wanted to make as much money as they possibly could. The more money they made, the more power they had, and the easier their life was. The more money they had, the, the more people they had to take care of them, and, and their lives were more luxurious. And often people had other people to manage their money for them. You might have someone who owned a large amount of land, and, and what they would do would be to rent that land out to local farmers. And the local farmers would be allowed to farm on that land, and then when the harvest came, they'd give a portion of the harvest to the landowner. Well, much of the time, the landowner didn't really want to mess with the day-to-day -day operations, and, and they didn't want to deal with all these peasant farmers. So he'd hire someone else to manage each one of these renters. He'd put them in charge of making sure that everyone paid exactly what they owed. And that's the story that Jesus is telling today. He's telling the story about a rich landowner who had a manager who was handling all of his, all these accounts. 
This manager had been put in charge of making sure that each one of the renters paid what they owed when it was time for the payments to come in. Jesus tells the story that this manager was lazy and wasteful. He wasn't doing his job properly and he was costing the rich landowner a lot of money. Now Jesus isn't specific about how he was wasting the owner's money, but you can imagine that he wasn't collecting debts or he was, he was skimming a little bit off the top or, or something. And so when the rich landowner found out about it, he went to the manager and he told him that he was fired. He wanted him to clean out his desk, turn in his ID card, and be out of the building by 5 o'clock. And that left this manager with a dilemma. He'd been living the high life as a manager. He wasn't really working all that hard, but he was making good money. And now he's facing the unemployment line. And he knew himself well enough to know that he wasn't suited for hard labor. And he was too proud to sit on the street and beg for money. So he came up with a plan that was going to keep him from having to do either one of those things. He was going to save some of the people who were renting the farmland some money. And in return, he knew that they were going to take care of him after he got fired. They were going to, to feed him and give him a place to stay when he needed it. So he took their debts and he cut them down. Jesus tells us that one of them he cut in half and another one he cut by 20%. And you can imagine that there were probably a lot of renters that he managed, so he probably spoke to every single one of them and cut their debt down so they would owe him one. Well, this manager, he'd already been costing his boss money. He's been wasteful with his boss's money. He's been stealing from his boss. And now he makes this extremely bold move and actually causes his boss to lose even more money. And he, and he does it as he's on his way out the door. This, this manager is a thief. And Jesus praises him for it. In verse 8, Jesus says that this manager's boss commended him for being so smart and, and using his resources to make friends so that he wouldn't be out on the street when he got fired. And then in verse 9, Jesus says, And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. Jesus is standing here in front of his disciples, telling this story, and it seriously sounds like he's encouraging them to break the seventh commandment. You shall not steal. But that's not quite the point that Jesus is trying to make here. Jesus isn't telling us to go out and, and steal from people and use other people's money in dishonest ways. He's not telling us that we should lie and cheat and steal and do whatever it takes to make as much money as we possibly can. So if that's not what he's saying, then what point is he trying to make here? Let's take a little bit closer look and see if we can't figure out what's going on with this very confusing sounding parable. Looking back at verse 8, Jesus says that the wealthy landowner commended this manager for his shrewdness. Now, he commended him, meaning that he was impressed by the way this manager got himself out of a jam. He was impressed by his ability to sidestep this landmine that was laying right in front of him. But even though he was impressed, it doesn't necessarily mean that he agreed with what he'd done. I mean, this wealthy landowner had just lost even more money because of this manager. He may have been impressed by his quick thinking and his action, but he was most likely very annoyed or angry about losing even more money. But this manager, he was, he was motivated. He had no desire to be out on the street begging for money. He had no desire to go and do manual labor in order to maybe get enough food to eat each day. He was motivated to keep himself living the lifestyle that he had become accustomed to. And I think we can all relate to that. We can relate to being motivated to, to make enough money to pay our bills. We can relate to being motivated to make enough money to take a nice vacation. We can relate to being motivated to make enough money so that we can do fun things and not worry about where our next meal is coming from. And that's the point that Jesus is making here. He's telling us that if this manager is that motivated with something like making sure that he didn't have to beg for food or money or making sure that he didn't have to do hard work in order to survive, then we should be motivated even more in our faith. And think about this with me for a minute. We work our tails off for so many things. We're willing to work hard so we can have a nice house and a nice car. We're willing to work hard so we can do certain things that we enjoy like going out and playing golf or, or going to a concert or going out to eat with friends or whatever it is you do. We're willing to work so hard to put money in the bank so that we have enough to rely on just in case things go south and we lose our jobs or we've got some big bills that come up unexpectedly. We're willing to work hard so that we can get ahead at our jobs and, and then get promoted and then make even more money and go do even more things. But do we apply that exact same motivation to our faith? 
Do we apply that exact same motivation to sharing the gospel with others? Do we apply that motivation to doing the things that we know we should be doing as Christians, like reading scripture and, and praying and sharing God's message of salvation with other people? We're willing to work so hard for things that make our lives here easier and more fun, but are we willing to put in the same work for something that we can't yet see? Are we willing to put in the same work in our faith lives, knowing that our reward for living a faithful life centered around Jesus and His Word means that we will receive the ultimate reward of eternal life when we leave this world? You see, the question Jesus is asking here is who or what is your God? Back to that dollar bill for a second. Back to that dollar bill again. It says, in God we trust. What God are you trusting? Are you trusting the God of money and stuff and worldly goods? Or are you trusting in the God that promises you eternal life through faith in Him? Now, Jesus is not telling us to completely abandon money and the things of the world here either. He, he isn't telling us that using money and things like that are inherently evil. He's just saying that we need to keep our eyes focused on Him and not putting money and the things of this world in front of Him. We should use money. We should participate in the economy. There's, there's nothing wrong with using the dollar bill to pay our bills. There's nothing wrong with putting money in the bank. There's nothing wrong with earning a lot of money and spending it and having fun and all those things. But before we do those things, it's important for us to remember where that money really comes from. It's important for us to remember how it is that we have anything and everything that we call our own. It's important for us to remember that everything comes to us from God. So while we are able to go out and spend our money the way we want to, while we are able to go out and work extra hard to make more money, it's so important to realize and to remember that we need to do things to the glory of God first. We need to serve God instead of serving money. Well, how do we do that? My friends, we've got the perfect example of putting heavenly things first. We have the perfect example of making sure that you're serving God and not serving the things of the world. And we even have the perfect example of using earthly things to do it. Jesus came to earth to live as a man and He showed us exactly how to do this. He came and, and He put others before Himself. He gave up His time to serve others. He, he wasn't concerned about making all sorts of money. He even gave up the opportunity to be an earthly king and sit on the throne in Jerusalem. Instead of taking that throne, He took the cross. He took the torture and the punishment for our sins instead of living the life of luxury. He took the pain and the excruciating agony and death instead of using His godly power to come down off that cross. He died and was laid in the tomb instead of making Himself better than everyone else. But His eyes weren't focused on the things of the world. His eyes weren't focused on making money and having a comfortable life here. His eyes weren't focused on the things that we often find ourselves focusing on. Instead, Jesus was focused on us. He was focused on earning our salvation. He was focused on living perfectly and then taking our punishment so that we can one day join Him in His heavenly glory. Jesus was focused on the things of God instead of the things of man because He knows that we can't do it on our own. That's our example. That's the path that Jesus took so that we know where we should be focused as well. Now, sure, we're not able to be perfect. We, we don't have to hang on the cross and die. We, we don't have to take any punishment for our sins because Jesus has already done that. But we need to serve others. And we can use worldly goods to do it. We can use the money that we work so hard for in order to live our faith out and in, in order to put our full faith and trust in God instead of putting it in ourselves or our money or, or how smart we are or all the things we do. We show that we're faithful to God, that we're serving God and not money by using that money to God's glory. When we put our giving, our offering as the first thing on our budget instead of the last thing, we're serving God. We're using the money that we have to give the glory to God. When we give the first tenth of what we have to God, we're using it for His glory. When we say that we're going to make sure that our tithe to the church or, or to a godly charity is going to be our top priority, Instead of that fun activity or that vacation or that new thing that we want to buy, we're using our money to the glory of God. 
My friends, God wants us to use the gifts that he's given us in this world to care for and to serve others. He wants us to use the gifts that he's given us for his glory. And and when we care for others, when we share our faith with others, when we live out our faith in our day-to-day lives, when we do these things, we aren't earning our spot in heaven. But we're making ourselves into a living proclamation of the gospel. We're making friends for ourselves in eternal dwellings through our witness, through our faith, and through our use of the goods that God gives to us. We're willing to work as hard at our faith as we are earning our paycheck. We're serving God and we're putting Him first. And, And through that powerful witness, we're bringing the gift of faith to others so that they too can one day join us in the eternal and perfect dwelling place of heaven. Amen. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all of our human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. Please stand with me as we go before God in prayer.